So Raymond, since COVID, we have often more people online than we have on, on the room. And I wouldn't be surprised that a lot of people that are online are actually sitting on lab in some office, right? Um, so. All right, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome everyone, both online and in person. Uh, today's a real pleasure to welcome Professor uh, Raymond Shaw. He is university professor in the Department of Physics at Michigan Technological University, where he's also the director of the Atmospheric Science Program. He got his PhD at Penn State, and he spent a couple of years, I presume, at NCAR as part of the Advanced Study Program for postdocs. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, and his main research interests are on the broad topic of cloud physics. And he uses a variety of instruments and laboratory experiments to better understand the physics of clouds. And as an example, one of the things that you've been very involved is to develop the Pi convection cloud chamber that you're going to talk to us about. So today, we welcome him, and he's going to tell us everything we need to know about how laboratory experiments help disentangle aerosol cloud interactions. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Th thanks, everybody. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to be here. And um, I don't know what your custom is, but I'm happy taking questions during the talk. But I don't, I don't want to uh, change any, any custom here at JPL. Uh, I also, of course, want to thank uh, my co-authors, my, you know, my collaborators who are not listed here. But over the years, a lot of students, a lot of postdocs, other faculty at Michigan Tech and other places have helped come up with some of these ideas, and, and this has all been a, a very collaborative project. Um, I've, I've noted here um, that this was supported by the US National Science Foundation. The Pi Chamber was built about 10 years ago, in fact, 2014, on Pi Day, March 14th. It was delivered to Michigan Tech. That was not planned. It was just fate. Um, uh, it was delivered to Michigan Tech, and so we've had 10 years to figure out how to use it and, and to extract science from it. And now we're dreaming about, you know, because we're scientists and engineers, we, we're never satisfied, right? We always want something bigger and better. So we're dreaming about a 10 times larger pie chamber. We, uh, right now the acronym is ACDC2, um, Aerosol Cloud Drizzle Convection Chamber. Uh, and, and there's a collaboration of, you know, 12 or so institutions and national labs that are involved with that project. It's not at the building stage yet. It's at the planning and dreaming and designing stage. And I'll talk about that at the very end of the discussion. But all of those people have, have played various roles as well. So thanks, thanks very much. Um, uh, I'll start. Um, just by talking about uh, sort of big picture, why, why are we interested in this problem? I know there are some of you in the audience that are, are world experts on this topic, but you know, humor me. I'll try to provide a, a perspective. Um, we live on this, on this planet uh, that is, is familiar to all of us from a, a satellite perspective. I, I would say that, that th this kind of perspective fundamentally changed humanity, didn't it? I mean, the ability to see our planet from outside of the planet uh, has changed our view. It certainly changed the environmental movement in, in the US and probably around the world. It views how we view, uh, I think it changed how we view each other, um, hopefully in mostly good ways. Uh, but the name is wrong, it turns out, that if, if you were an alien or if you were a visitor coming to this planet, for the first time. You might not call it Earth. Um, if you took a look at it from outside, and certainly if you were interested in the climate of this planet, um, you might call it planet ocean cloud. And I've, I've borrowed this terminology from uh, Glenn Shaw, who was a professor at University of Alaska and was one of the founders of the whole idea that aerosols produced by bio biological systems could modulate the climate system. Uh, so either from a biological perspective or certainly from, uh, from a climate perspective, considering this as, a, as an ocean-covered planet that has clouds is necessary, right? It's a necessary part of understanding the, uh, the system. So this is a visible image uh, of the planet. 
obviously a little dated. The, the resolution is not as nice as what we can get these days. Um, here's, if, if, if we were visitors to the planet who could see, you know, we're optically parochial, right? We're, we're biased towards the visible wavelengths. And uh, if, if we were visiting from a planet where um, maybe we had a star that, you know, was radiating peak at, in the infrared, then we would see a, a planet Earth that looks like this. This isn't what the typical infrared image of the planet looks like, of course, because we don't like to think about clouds as being dark and the surface as being bright, and so we usually take a negative, right? But in reality, I think if you were looking in the far infrared at the planet, you would see something like this. You would see this hot planet boiling energy out into space, right? Infrared radiation, and some of the clouds would actually look lower temperature. They would look darker, right? Emitting at a lower, at a lower radiative temperature. Um, so, and, and this is part of the puzzle of how clouds influence the climate system. You know, there's this mysterious kind of almost magical, perfect balance between the reflected sunlight in the visible and the reduced emission temperature in the, in the infrared. Uh, and, and that looks like it holds for almost all the clouds on the planet, except for these humble clouds that you, you, know, you might not even notice. Uh, oops, sorry, there we go. Um, like these types of clouds that are almost the same temperature as, as the Earth, and so you hardly notice them in the infrared image. But clearly, they're important in the visible image. So, and these are the clouds that tend to offset this, that kind of tip the balance, right? And make clouds net cooling, net cooling, so that they have a similar radiative temperature uh, as, as the surface, but they are still efficient at reflecting sunlight away from the planet. So, for the purposes of this talk, I'll focus, I'll use these. Clouds is sort of the, the playground or the, you know, the, the context for, for what we're going to be discussing. Um, so the you know, stratocumulus clouds. So zooming in, those clouds might look something like this. This is the northeastern part of the US. I think you can tell from the geography there. Um, I've just pulled a quote that, I mean, there are any number of papers that, uh, that have similar types of ideas, but this is from Tapio Schneider and, and co-authors in a recent uh, overview paper in Physics Today, uh, just pointing out that really when, uh, when it comes to predicting climate, the, the sticking points, the principal sticking points are subgrid scale turbulent and convective motions in the oceans and the atmosphere. And you have people here at JPL who are you know, really leading uh, the effort to represent these things in, in subgrid scale, uh, you know, subgrid scale types of, of uh, processes. I'm going to zoom in even, f even more for the purposes of this talk and, and discuss uh, what sometimes we call the microphysics, right? So it's the, really the fine scale cloud processes. Now, I made the claim in the title of the talk that we're helping to disentangle aerosol cloud interactions. That's a pretty bold claim, but I think the key is the word help. Nobody's, no single person and no single, single lab is going to solve the climate problem, right? Or even solve the cloud, cloud radiation property problem. Uh, but I think by, uh, what I'm hoping is that by the end of the talk today, I can convince you that laboratory work uh, has a role to play and can really help us nail some important problems, some, some problems that have been bothering us for many years, for decades, in fact, uh, that maybe, you know, with, with some targeted effort, we could just nail that down uh, and say that pro problem is done, right? And then we can move on uh, beyond that to, uh, to do maybe some of the, the more complicated problems of the coupling between microphysics and dynamics and so forth uh, to, that tell us about cl uh, cloud patterns. So uh, just a, a little bit of perspective on, on that. Um, so aerosol indirect effects on clouds and precipitation, we can put into at least three categories. One of those effects is popularly known as the Toomey effect. 
Uh, and that's this idea that if we increase the cloud condensation nucleus concentration, let's just generically say if we increase the aerosol concentration, then we'll have a decrease in the cloud droplet diameter. And I'm showing this uh, just generically in this equation. This is the optical thickness of the cloud. And you can see that that can be written as a product of the liquid water content and uh, one over the effective radius. So if I increase the number of aerosol particles and I decrease the effective radius, then I'm increasing tau, right? And so I'm making the clouds brighter. As long as liquid water content remains constant, which probably almost never happens, but that, you know, that was the original assumption, is that L, if L is a constant, then it's a pretty simple, simple idea. Um, I'm defining for, for those of you who aren't in the, in the, that area, there's a definition of effective radius. It's a third moment of the size distribution divided by a second moment of the, of the size distribution and appears naturally for, you know, in remote sensing context. Uh, the second way we might think about an aerosol indirect effect is, um, could be called a, a dispersion effect. Um, if we increase cloud condensation nucleus concentration, uh, there's some empirical evidence, and I think maybe a little bit of theory to back it up, that, uh, that there's a decrease in the cloud droplet distribution width. Okay, let me just say that again. If, if I increase the number of aerosols or the number of condensation sites for a cloud, I not only make all the droplets smaller, but I tend to make the distribution of droplet sizes narrower, right? So you could think of the, the cloud becomes more homogeneous. And why would that be important? Well, well it's important because uh, as was shown quite a few years ago and has been you know, f followed on by, by others, uh, Yangang Liu at Brookhaven Lab and, and, and other places, that you know, the, the shape, what we could call the, the um, you know, the, this is sometimes called the dispersion, in fact, sig sigma r over r bar uh, influences the effective radius. So for a given mean droplet size, the effective radius is going to depend on how skewed that distribution is. It's a third moment over a second moment, so it makes sense that the longer tail it has, the more, the, the more different the effective radius will be from just a simple mean, mean radius, okay? And then the last one uh, that I'll mention here, and there are more, of course, there are more indirect effects. That, you know, there's, it's kind of a whole zoology of indirect effects now but uh, it would be called the cloud lifetime effect. Sometimes um, it may be called an Albrecht type of effect. So the idea is that a smaller droplet diameter and narrower distribution width leads to suppressed precipitation formation. And so maybe not only by polluting the clouds would we make the droplets smaller and, and that has a tendency to make them brighter, maybe we make the droplets hang around, or sorry, the clouds hang around a little bit longer. It turns out this can go in the opposite direction. It's, it's very subtle, and the community is sort of disentangling all of this. There are cases where adding more aerosols would, would actually cause the clouds maybe to evaporate more quickly. So it's, it's, it's a tricky, tricky thing. But I, I, I want to especially draw attention to this third bullet point, um, and I'll, I'll come back to it at the end of the talk, talk uh, discussing the, the larger, cloud chamber, um, part of being able to get this third bullet point and the associated dynamical changes that happen with, in cloud fields, especially these stratocumulus cloud fields, is getting what's called the auto conversion rate right, right? The, the rate at which you convert uh, cloud water into precipitable water that can be removed from the cloud. Uh, sometimes referred to as auto conversion. It's a modeling word, right? It comes from an artificial dividing of, of water into two categories. And, uh, and if you don't get that auto conversion rate correct, then, uh, then it's hard to get the whole problem right in terms of how much mass is in the cloud, how long the cloud lasts, and, and where it will precipitate. It's, it's sort of a well-known problem that models have a difficult time Coarse resolution models have a hard time 
getting this exactly right, and, and as well as getting radiative properties right all simultaneously. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to do something a little, let me just go backwards to not distract you from it. I, I'm, I'm going to do something a, a little bit different. I'm going to show you a few results before I even show you, before I even tell you about the cloud chamber and how it works. So I want to convince you before I even start that, that uh, you should uh, think about this cloud chamber as something that can really produce a result that is that looks like the Earth's atmosphere, that looks like a stratocumulus cloud. Okay, so before I give you the details on, on the chamber, uh, I'll just show you um, some things that certainly surprised us. On the left, you see a plot that is well known, I think, in the remote sensing community, right? Uh, this is essentially related to the dispersion effect. It's the idea that you can um, that you can relate the third moment of a distribution to the, the third power of the effective radius, just as a constant, k. And empirically, it was observed, this is, this is, these are data from stratocumulus cloud measurements, and you can see that k is 0 0.67. So this is mean volume radius cubed versus effective radius, all right? Empirical result and embedded into certain retrieval processes, right? Uh, on the right here, I'm showing you data from, from the cloud chamber. And it's not cooked. It's, it really is just from you go into the cloud chamber, you set it up, and you do an experiment with low aerosol injection. You take a bunch of data, you get one data point, right? And then the next day, you crank up the aerosols, and you start all over again. You create a cloud, and you measure the size distribution, and then you call it a day, you go home, you come in the next day, you turn up the aerosols even higher, right? So each data point here, each data point here is a, is a you know, maybe a day-long experiment, okay, in which we measured the droplet size distribution, we can calculate the third moment, we can calculate the effective radius, all the moments of the distribution, and we can plot those. And, and uh, then, you know, we knew about this kind of work and we thought, okay, well, let's, let's just see what the slope is. And it, it's kind of mind blowing. It, it's embarrassingly good, right? When you get a result that good, nobody trusts you, right? They assume that, that, you're, that you're trying to cook the books or something like that. So, okay, take it for what it is. It, it's 0 0.66 with the best esti estimate of our uncertainty. Um, if you zoom in, if, if you do a fit here, for example, um, you get uh, a slope of 0.84. And if you take these points out here and you do a separate slope, you get 0.62, right? You can see just a, a little bit of curvature there. It's not perfectly linear. So you can zoom in and ask questions about how might this dispersion effect vary. But I, I just want to, I'm, I'm just showing you this so you can see there's this sort of surprising result that this highly idealized three cubic meter, uh, you know, pi, pi cubic meter box of droplets apparently is able to reproduce at least some of the physics that a, you know, a two kilometer deep, let's say infinitely horizontal extent stratocumulus cloud system creates. I find that remarkable. I, I, I find it. Um, uh, kind of a, a, an amazing result. Here's another one. The, so these are uh, field aircraft data. This is the relative dispersion. Uh, so it's the standard deviation of the droplet radius over the mean radius versus number concentration from uh, a field project called CSET, where we were, you know, the people were flying from, I think, from Sacramento to Hawaii and back. Right, basically trying to look at the transition from stratiform clouds to you know kind of these small cumulus uh, clouds, and and we had an instrument uh, on on that flight on the NCAR G5 
uh, th th that we built um, in, uh, first in our group and then, and then sort of did the second generation instru instrument with NCAR. It makes a holographic image of a cloud. I'm not going to talk about it here. It's a whole separate thing. And you can measure the size distribution of, of droplets in this cloud. Uh, and, and so you can get a direct measurement of sigma r over r bar and number concentration from microphysically local volumes. You're not having to smear it out over 100 meters, right? These are really, this is the size of your hand, right? Your fist, uh, a, a group of cloud droplets from something that big, a holographic image. So you really get a microphysically local measurement of those properties. Um, and, and these are just some different flights that we chose. Okay, and so you can see uh, a case where the cloud droplet concentration was relatively high and the dispersion was low, relative dispersion was low. As you go to clouds with progressively lower concentrations of droplets, uh, you eventually get broad distributions. Probably this one is precipitating. Uh, these other ones, we tried pretty hard to find clouds that were not obviously precipitating. Uh, so there, you know, there's a whole story here that I, I won't go into. But the interesting thing is, you know, because we have this expertise in digital holography, we decided, well, let's make a version of our instrument that goes inside of the cloud chamber. Let's let's make a hologram of of droplets in the cloud chamber, and uh, and so we, you know, we uh, took some data with similar kinds of aerosol concentrations as these clouds. And you can see those blue open circles kind of scattered around here. And again, there's just sort of this, to me, an amazing result that this simple box is able to produce microphysical properties that they just, I mean, if I put that there and I didn't tell you it came from a cloud chamber, you would, you would believe that it came from the field project, right? It, it looks really similar. Um, so, so what's going on here? Uh, well, here's the argument, and and uh, and you can tell me if you if you agree or disagree. But I would argue that this is a signal to us that the physics must be fundamentally simple. You know, there there must be a few ingredients that are similar between a stratocumulus cloud and what we have in in this convection cloud chamber. Uh, and, and what are those ingredients from a, from a microphysicist perspective, right? So I'm ignoring all the large scale complexity that we know exists uh, in, in these clouds. So let's just set that to the side. From a microphysical perspective, what you have are aerosols that are activated. They grow by condensation. Eventually, probably some subset of them grow by uh, collision and coalescence, and then things fall out. Right? I'm neglecting entrainment. Of course, that's important. There, there are other processes uh, that may or may not have analogs with what's going on in the, in the convection cloud chamber. So the question is, well, can, can we create the, these kinds of processes in the laboratory as a bare minimum, sort of the, the Bohr atom of clouds, right? You know, just take the, the, the sort of minimal perspective. Can we do something at its most basic level? and just get these processes to occur in a cloud chamber so that we can, you know, we can, then we can make our own kind of ship track experiments and, and things like that. Okay, uh, so can we do that? So I, I would argue that the essential ingredients for a steady state shallow cloud layer are that, you know, one, you need a turbulent mixed layer, right? This is a la um, uh, Lily, Deerdorf kinds of ideas, right? So I need a turbulent mixed layer. Uh, which it, it provides this forcing of supersaturation. Uh, I need some kind of steady source of CCN, right? Whether it's an ocean surface, whatever it might be, I need, I need CCN. And I need the cloud microphysics, of course. I need to represent the activation and the growth processes. And then I need removal by sedimentation. So the, those are the, the ingredients that we uh, sort of built into the convection cloud chamber. So what is it? How do we do these things? Well, so the first one is we need a turbulent mixed layer. The convection cloud chamber is based on one of the canonical flows of fluid mechanics, right? Just, you know, Rayleigh Benard, thermal convection, Rayleigh Benard convection. I, I take a system, um, I heat it on the bottom, I cool it on the top, 
You can argue about what to do with the sidewalls. That's, you know, that's uh, something that can be discussed. But for now, let's just say they're adiabatic. Um, and, and you get a turbulent flow, right? If you exceed a certain Rayleigh number, which is the, you know, it's the non-dimensional temperature gradient, basically, or the non-dimensional measure of the departure from equilibrium, right? Uh, so I have a Rayleigh number, and then the amount of heat or the, the amount of the, the transport in this system is captured by the Nusselt number, which scales as the one-third power of the Rayleigh number for this idealized flow. Uh, and, and this, what you see on the right, is from a, from a liquid, a, a water convection tank, right? Heated from below and, and cooled from above. These are reminiscent of the Deerdorf experiments done at NCAR in the 60s and 70s, right, that led to a lot of our perspectives that we have today on, on planetary boundary layers. And, um, so that's, that's step one, right? We needed a mixed layer. That's how we get the mixed layer. And step two, we need supersaturation forcing. So the idea is, is conceptually simple. Um, if, if, if you think about the, the saturation vapor pressure or the equilibrium vapor pressure of water, it's an exponential, right? We know that as the clausius clapeyron equation. Um, and if, if I mix, warm, saturated air with cold, saturated air. You know, mixing is a linear process, or at least isobaric mixing is a linear process. And so the mixture, maybe this here at this T mix, T mix uh, it, it has a vapor pressure that's significantly higher than the equilibrium vapor pressure at that temperature. And I think, you know, we, we sort of have all learned this at some point, right? We know this is how contrails form. This is why when I left Chicago, um, a couple of days ago, it was, you know, minus 10 Fahrenheit outside, and the nice humid air from my lungs created a beautiful cloud when, when I breathed out, right? Trying to make, trying to find something positive about minus 10 Fahrenheit, right? It, it makes for nice mixing clouds. Uh, what you see on the right uh, is, is how this is implemented in the pie chamber. So we, we have thermal convection, right, hot bottom, cold top, but we saturate these surfaces. So the top is saturated at water, va water vapor, saturated, and the bottom is saturated. Um, and then this is illuminated by a laser, and if we inject aerosols so that water can condense on them, uh, we get a cloud. Okay, so here's a schematic view of what it would look like. The, the name Pi Chamber comes from the volume. It's a cylinder with a radius of one meter and a height of one meter, so it has a volume of pi cubic meters, um, and we, you know, in one mode of operation, you could say that we have a continuous source of aerosols, and those aerosols are continuously fed into the chamber. They're continuously activating, uh, you know, maybe uh, causing some interactions with the vapor field um, and competing with cloud droplets for growth. This is mostly by condensation, but there's no reason, at least in general, it could occur through uh, coalescence. And eventually, these particles sediment out of, of the chamber. So the argument here is that we have all of the fundamental ingredients for shallow water, or shallow clouds, right? We have the turbulent mixing, mixed layer. We have the supersaturation forcing. We have the microphysical processes resolved with perfect resolution, right? Uh, and then we have sedimentation. So yeah, I think I see a, a question, yeah. Can your chamber simulate, uh, because you mentioned the ocean wall at the beginning, right? Can your chambers uh, simulate the cloud formation over water or over land? Good, good question. The question for those online was, can we simulate a cloud over the ocean, over on land? I suppose in some ways we probably could do that. If, if we were sneaky about this lower boundary condition, we could make it subsaturated. And we've in fact done that where we add salt to the bottom boundary and so you can adjust. That way you can reach the same no salt number but have different relative humidities. Anyway, but that's getting into the into the details, but in, in principle, yes. You can also change the roughness of the surface. If you wanna play around with turbulent fluxes, you can add you know, bars or some kind of roughness elements to the surface to, to look at the, the turbulent fluxes. 
um, okay, this, this uh, if you look at what we have here, one view, I guess, is we have, I, I like to say that this is like a single grid box of a large eddy simulation. You know, your best cloud model, right, is maybe an LES, um, but everything smaller than the grid scale of your LES has to be parameterized, right, or, or somehow represented in a simplified way. Here we have the opposite. We know nothing about the large scale structure of the cloud field, right? We don't know how the cloud droplets are feeding back onto the overall structure. We have one grid cell, admittedly a high resolution grid cell, right, a few cubic meters. Uh, but we resolve everything inside of that grid cell perfectly, right? So we, we, t we tell this cell what are the fluxes on the boundaries, which is exactly what an LES is doing in a subgrid scale uh, parameterization. So we, we prescribe the fluxes on the outside, we inject the aerosols, and then nature provides a fully resolved representation of the microphysics. No approximations, right? All of the collisions, all of the growth, all of the activation is happening in its purest sense, okay? Um, so what I would argue um, is that we've created, if, if, if you either are gamers or maybe you have kids or, or grandkids or whatever who uh, like video games, so I, I, when, when student groups come in to visit the cloud chamber, I tell them this is, this is like a single Minecraft block for clouds, right? So it's not that we're creating an entire cloud system in, in the laboratory, we're making one Minecraft block. Right? We know all the properties of a cloud inside of that block. And then if you put enough blocks together, maybe you can say that's what a real cloud will look like. Okay, it's oversimplified, of course, but it's, it's at least a perspective. Um, and I, would, I, I hope that I've convinced you by showing data, even before we started, that perhaps amazingly, the microphysical properties look like stratocumulus clouds. The, the turbulence properties are, are similar, you know, the energy dissipation rates and the microphysical properties look like they could have been, you know, they could have come from, uh, from a stratocumulus cloud, just a garden variety stratocumulus cloud. So I, I, I tried to make the case that these four ingredients would give us enough to have a mixed layer cloud that looks like stratocumulus and I, you know, at least at some level, I think uh, we can say that that's accomplished. So now I'm going to um, show you what that looks like and show you some data. So this is not from a simulation, this is from an experiment, this is from the pie chamber. This is roughly, I would say, a 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter region of cloud that is illuminated by a laser light sheet. So you're looking at a sheet of light that is you know, maybe a couple millimeters thick and 20 by 20 centimeters. You can see the edge of an instrument here. This, I, I can't remember what instrument it was. This is just a wire that's out of focus or something like that. Um, and and uh, unlike typical particle image velocimetry that you know, we do in, in mechanical engineering, for example, where you have to seed the flow with particles. In this case, the particles are naturally created through super, you know, grow, condensation growth of aerosols. The aerosols are too small to see with the camera and the optics that we have. So you don't see the aerosols. All you see are the droplets that have, you know, the condensed water on the aerosols. Uh, so, and, and, and that's, you know, from one experiment, you can now repeat this, right? You can perform multiple experiments, yeah. Great question. No, that, this is actually a side view. So this, this is a kind of a vertically oriented sheet and we're looking from the side. Yeah, yes? Are you going to use a shadow graph technique to uh, look at the temperature field? Uh, that's a great question. Um, that first video that I showed was using shadow graphy. We've tried and we haven't really succeeded yet, but I think it's mostly due to our lack of uh, really focusing on the problem. Uh, the, the gradients are pretty small, though, uh, for shadow graphy to work. Um, I think maybe we would see something in the boundary layers, but I'm not so sure we would see anything in the bulk. But I'd be happy to talk about that. It's kind of a nice, nice technique. If you, if you do this kind of experiment, like I 
explained before, every day you come in and you reset the aerosol properties, right? That's the nice thing for, for in the lab, the aerosol input is a knob you can turn, right? You can choose the size, the concentration, the composition, even the size distribution. Uh, so you choose your own atmosphere, you get to see what kind of cloud forms on, on those aerosols, right? So you can make the, mo the cleanest, most pristine cloud you can imagine over the oceans to the cloud that would form you know, in a very polluted environment. And that's what we're trying to show here. So on the right, you see a little, just a slice of that, that, uh, that image that I showed before for a very clean cloud. And then um, you, know, you can form a new cloud and then another one with a higher aerosol concentration, higher aerosol concentration, and even higher. And, and so you can see vividly, you can see the Toomey effect with your own eyes, right? That the, there are actually two effects happening here. One is that the liquid water content actually increases as you increase, as, as you increase the aerosols because you reduce the settling velocity of the particles. So you can hold more water in this cloud because the settling velocity is smaller. Uh, and then the second one, of course, is that smaller droplets, given the same liquid water content, smaller droplets will scatter more light to our detector. Uh, so what, one thing that I want to emphasize here that's really an important difference compared to standard, you know, most of us, when we think of a cloud chamber, we think of an expansion, kind of an Aitken type chamber or, or um, CTR Wilson type chamber, right? Uh, where you perform an expansion, which is necessarily a, a, a transient experiment, right? You have an expansion, you have cloud droplet growth until the walls take over and they deplete your supersaturation and then the experiment's over. Uh, in this case, the, the experiment can be done in steady state, right? As long as you keep the power on and keep the temperature gradient in, applied, and as long as you keep feeding aerosols into the system, it's like a well-balanced, you know, where in income equals expenses, right? And so, yeah, you have, a, you have a, a balanced budget, so to speak, inside of the cloud chamber that all, every aerosol that goes in eventually falls out as a cloud droplet. And what happens in between is what we want to study. So. Okay, so I, I'm going to just give you a whirlwind tour without going into any details. I know it might be madly, a little bit frustrating, but I'll give you a quick tour of some of what we think are important results that have come out of 10 years of research with the, with the pie chamber. Um, I mentioned the dispersion effect, uh, and, and this was our first view of that, that uh, w you know, we tried to reproduce the Toomey effect by saying, well, let's, let's start with a really low aerosol injection rate, then let's do another experiment with a higher aerosol injection rate and so forth. You can see these droplet size distributions that I've plotted. Each one of these experiments is in steady state, right? We wait for the system to reach its dynamic equilibrium, and then we start our measurements. We measure for a few hours, and then we, you, know, you can start the next experiment. And uh, we progressively increased uh, the aerosol concentration until clearly we lost patience and said, well, let's just hit it with a hammer, right, and see, see where it goes. And so we, we, you know, we made it extremely polluted. And, and so we saw one thing that we expected and another thing that we were surprised by. Uh, the thing that we expected, of course, is that the mean droplet diameter decreases as we increase the aerosol concentration. That, that's you know, a Toomey type effect. And, that makes sense. The part that we didn't expect at that time uh, was this pretty dramatic difference in the width of the distribution. And I, you know, I had sort of heard about a dispersion effect, but I hadn't read the papers. I had just neglected it. And so we, you know, we went and read uh, all of these papers and learned about this whole community of people, dis you know, studying dispersion effects. And, and we learned that, oh, we can see that. And so it's, it's data like these that went into the effective radius plot that I showed you uh, towards the beginning, right? That showed the, you know, the nice agreement with Martin et al, 1994. So this is one, uh, one view. I won't go into the details, but you know, one, there, there are a few different effects that cause this. One of them, however, is that in a, in a, in a polluted cloud, the thermodynamic fields are, are completely buffered out. 
and, and fluctuations are suppressed, right? Because there are so many droplets, they're so small, they can respond, they're very agile, right? And they essentially buffer out any turbulent fluctuations. So all droplets experience the same mean field and they have the sort of the same size. In a weakly polluted cloud, there aren't enough droplets to buffer out the turbulent fluctuations. And so you get a broader, you get a broader, dis, you know, you, you get the, the, the haves and the have, the have nots, right? It's, it's a, 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 a non-egalitarian type of cloud where some droplets maybe are very lucky to gain a lot of condensed water and other droplets are not. And so you have a broader distribution. Okay, so that's, that, that's one, I think, nice, nice result. Here's uh, another one. Excuse uh, me, uh, Raymond, I think yeah, there's please. a question online. So sure, um, sure. should I repeat the question or, or can we? So this is a question, I think, from Anthony Davis. What do you use for aerosols? What do you use for aerosols? Ah, oh, OK. Yeah, what do we use for aerosols? Um, OK, I, I just wasn't sure if somebody was trying to ask the, that question. That's OK. Um, we, we often use just simple sodium chloride. But uh, you know, that's, that's a whole field of, of study. Right? Is you know what if we use phthalic acid, or what if we use black carbon, or um, you, you know the the list goes on and on and on. And, and you know atmospheric chemistry. I hope I'm not offending anybody. Atmospheric chemistry can be a bit of a black hole, right? You just get sucked in. Uh, but so yeah, we've we've played around with that a little bit. Um, it is really really interesting. I think the important thing here is that you can control it. Right? So at least in principle, anything that's soluble or that you can generate by burning or a dust, it can be generated through a, uh, a fluidized bed. Uh, we, can, we can make a cloud with whatever aerosol you want to bring to the table. Um, yeah, great question. And in fact, this, this slide is about activation. One of the things that we discovered uh, is that there are different regimes for for aerosol activation. So most of us like to think about you have a population of aerosols and you either activate some or you don't, right? And if you activate a sodium chloride aerosol particle with the diameter of 100 microns, then all of the sodium chloride particles with a diameter of 100 microns would be activated. But what we realized is that th there's actually a distribution of saturation ratios in the cloud if it's not overly buffered. Um, and so if you have a critical supersaturation for a given aerosol type, uh, you might have a situation where the forcing is strong and then our classical picture holds that all of the aerosols are activated as expected. You might also have a scenario B here where um, some of the aerosols are activated, but there are fluctuations that cause a, a saturation ratio below the critical value that might actually deactivate an aerosol particle that based on the mean saturation ratio, you would expect it to be activated. But you're not in a mean field, right? You're in a turbulent field. And so you can, de in the cloud chamber, we can activate and deactivate aerosol particles many, many tens of times before they're eventually removed from the system if it's a polluted, polluted cloud. And then you can even get this more exotic regime uh, where, where the mean supersaturation is below the critical value, but there's a tail that will give you some activated droplets. So you see these little plumes, just these little puffs of droplet activation. It looks like EDMF, doesn't it? It looks like the supersaturation PDF. Uh, I mean, I was looking at some of the plots today thinking, wow, that it looks exactly like, like what some of you are working on, the, just at a different scale. Uh, so it's kind of an in interesting connection there. Uh, another thing th that we've done is looked at mixed phase clouds. So there's nothing that stops us from reducing the temperature down to say minus 10. And what you see here, I'm just showing qualitatively uh, in the upper left panel, these are also laser light sheets illuminating clouds. So here's a minus, let's say, I, you know, minus seven, minus eight, something like that cloud that consists of only sodium chloride aerosols, okay? 
I inject sodium chloride aerosols, so I get liquid droplets, no freezing. So this is a 100% uh, super cool liquid cloud. Uh, now, going down here to the lower left, I, I keep this, the sodium chloride CCN injection the same, but now I bung in just a little bit of ice nucleating particles. In this case, we used Snowmax, it's a biological material, right? Just a tiny bit. And you can start to see some little bright spots, some little flickers that are the ice crystals that are starting to form. But it's still predominantly a supercooled cloud, just with a very small ice water mixing ratio. Then, still keeping the CCN injection rate the same, if we increase f yet more the, uh, the ice nucleating particle injection rate, now you can really see that the qualitative nature of the cloud has changed, and it's more ice. And if we keep doing that, we can now essentially convert all the mass, or you know, more than 90% of the mass, to ice. So we're, you know, in, in this, in this relatively simple experiment, we're able to show, and, and we, you know, derive a thermodynamic condition for coexistence or not coexistence of the two phases, and and sort of solve this long-standing mystery of, you know, how can you have these long-lived Arctic stratus clouds that are you know, everybody thinks, well, if they have ice in them, then why don't they just glaciate? Why don't they just freeze over, right? We all know the Bergeron effect, right? Why, why don't they freeze? Well, I think part of it is a, a story like this. You have to have enough ice to freeze. And if you're, if you're limited on ice nucleating particles, you can still keep a system in steady state even though it's out of equilibrium, right? Out of thermodynamic equilibrium because you're constantly forcing it. Uh, this is, I think, the last little highlight that I'll show you that just published uh, last year. So we, we decided, well, oh, well, entrainment is important for these clouds. That's the one thing we're missing, right, is entrainment. So we, we have a, a hole in the top of the chamber, and we decided, let's pump in dry air. Let's take some air. Let's control the humidity. Let's control the um, temperature. And let's just push that down into this well-mixed cloud layer and see what happens. And these are some snapshots of the interface that you see between the cloud below and the clear air that's, being, that's experiencing a controllable subsidence rate, right? something like a one centimeter per second subsidence rate. And, and you can see these kinds of uh, filamentary mixing events that occur. And then we can look for the microphysical signatures of this entrainment, right? We can say, oh, you know, do, is the mixing homogeneous or inhomogeneous? I, I won't get into the details of that, but it, it, was, it was really interesting to us to see that the perspective you get on the microphysical response to mixing depends on the scale of averaging. What might look locally as inhomogeneous mixing globally looks uh, homogeneous. And so this kind of quandary that's been bugging the community for a long time, we think that this at least provides a, a perspective. Okay, in the last couple minutes, I want to show you uh, more about this collaboration. The, you know, so the, the dream is, uh, you know, the one piece we're missing, you could say, from, from stratocumulus clouds is we, we really want them to drizzle, right? We want to nail the autoconversion problem that I mentioned at the beginning. And we can't do that as far as we know in, in the pie chamber. It's just, it's only a meter tall. The residence times of droplets, especially when they start getting to drizzle size, it's just too short. They fall out very quickly. So we want to get uh, to drizzle. And so we put together uh, with support from NSF and DOE, a, a big group of labs and, uh, and universities to, to try to design this aerosol cloud drizzle convection chamber. So the same kind of convection chamber, but just scaling it up uh, so that we can produce the full range of growth processes that would occur, uh, occur in, a, in this type of cloud. Um, that you saw there's a Caltech connection there as well. Um, we can talk about that if anybody's curious. And there's, even a, there's also kind of a JPL connection as well. Uh, this, this shows you a, a large eddy simulation just showing that if, if you take, um, so here, here results with collisions turned off, the solid lines, they all produce the same 
droplet size distribution. This is a, a, a convection chamber of height one meter, then two meters, then four meters, where it starts getting really expensive. This is large eddy simulation, but with the, the, the grid box size is like three centimeters. So it's pretty small large eddies, right, for, compared to what atmospheric people are used to. If you turn collisions on, and you look at how this scales with height, you can see that the, the production of drizzle starts to become, or the, at least the production of droplets that have experienced you know, one or two collisions starts to become important. Uh, so the key variable here, uh, without going into a lot of details, is, is, is to increase the height, right? To go from one meter, and you know, if you did a back of the envelope calculation, you would say, well, what's the mean free path for a collision? event in the atmosphere. Turns out that it's roughly 10 meters. So you would want the mean free path of a collision to be of the same order as the height of the chamber, right? And that, you know, that was about as much as we did for the proposal to say, well, we think it's 10 meters, but we want to we wanna make sure it's really 10 meters. Th this collaboration, by the way, is a design collaboration. There's no guarantee that this chamber will ever be built. We hope it will be built, but um, uh, right now, we're just sort of dreaming and thinking, what, what would it need to look like to be able to achieve this goal? Um, so here's, here's the current design, just, just in my, my last few minutes. So um, if we've done some work on a, a nine, nine to 10 meter chamber, so nine meters by three by three. So we've gone from, I like to say the pie chamber is like a tuna can, and now we're going to a Pringles can. Right? Or, or maybe more like a Jenga block tower, because it's, you know, there's, for technical reasons, we want to go to a, a square, you know, kind of a square cross section. Um, so the height allows for these long aerosol and cloud droplet residence times, which allows for the, you know, the collisional path that, that you would need to, to be able to see, uh, see collision coalescence. And one of the ideas here is to, because as, as you increase the aspect ratio, right, uh, then the walls become progressively more dominant and deplete your supersaturation. So one of the ideas is to force laterally as well. It, it's not exactly Rayleigh Benar convection, it's called the window, the window pane problem, right? Where you have a cold pane and a warm pane and you have convection between them. It's the same physics though, right? You're just driving turbulent convection, whether you do it from the sides or the top and the bottom. Uh, and, and so this will allow to have uniform and high supersaturations through supersaturation forcing throughout the volume. Uh, and, and then another kind of exciting aspect that we've been looking at is to have panels, either one by two or one by one meter panels that are independently temperature controlled so that we can do more exotic things like make uh, cloud layers, separate cloud layers with different mixing properties. Uh, at different segments of the, of the cloud. Or, for example, maybe you would make a full cloud layer down here, and then up here on the top, you would have dry, subsaturated air so that you have a, a, a full entrainment layer um, between them and, and look at entrainment processes. It just gives a lot of, a lot of flexibility. Um, this is, uh, you know, well, let me, let me just say one more thing about this. Uh, th I, I think the JPL connection is nice here. Um, th the, uh, th this project has two, sort of two parts. There's a build the chamber part. How do you build a chamber? What does it need to look like to be able to produce drizzle drops? Um, and then there's a, there's a detector. Part, right? How do you build the instruments needed to be able to detect whether you have drizzle in this chamber? And one of them has some, some sort of roots to JPL, uh, Ken Cooper and others who have been working on terahertz radar technology, um, and Pavlos Kolias at Stony Brook University and his group have been collaborating, are, are part of this collaboration. And, and we've been looking at using very small radar sample volumes where you know, basically you would have one or zero drizzle particles in the vo volume at any given time. Even there might be hundreds or thousands of cloud droplets, it's small enough, the chances of encountering a drizzle particle are very small. And so you can imagine using a radar like that in surveillance mode, where you could actually 
spot. Uh, there is, you could scan. There's a drizzle particle here, there's one here, there's one here, and there's one down there. Or maybe, in a really crazy world, you could track a drizzle particle, right? You could scan, you could say, okay, I find this drizzle, drizzle particle, I want to watch that one, and I'm going to follow it as it moves around in this circulating, turbulent flow, and maybe even the reflectivity tells you how rapidly it grows, right? By collisions, each time it experiences a collision, the reflectivity increments by some, by, by some value. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that is just, it, you know, it's helping us to think about the technology in ways that at least most of us, uh, most of the cloud physics community hasn't really thought about at, at those kinds of scales. So really exciting. The other connection to JPL that I should mention uh, is that you, you sort of have some really exciting opportunities here as well uh, with the planetary aerosol cloud chamber that is being built by Mike Pawkin and, and <coughs> others uh, that, that I think you know, is, borrow, is basically using some of the ideas from the pie chamber of, of you know, convection type of forcing of, of the turbulence and, and the supersaturation forcing. And although it's designed to look at planetary atmospheres in general, we're a planet, right? Earth is a planet too. And there's no reason the JPL chamber couldn't, couldn't use water as, as it's working material for, for cloud formation. So I think there's just a lot of exciting opportunities here at JPL and, and also you know, in, in other chambers that are either exist or are being developed. So I, I'm just showing this as, as my closing slide. Um, nobody reads conclusion slides anyway, so I just wanted to sort of show my, you know, the kind of the big idea, I think, that I, I hope I've convinced you of is that, yeah, we, we can we can create these types of microphysical processes in the laboratory. Clearly, we're not going to access all of the large-scale dynamical uh, processes that we're very interested in. But you know, there are other tools for, for studying those, those processes. So we can go from aerosol activation to droplet growth by condensation. Maybe we can dream about a chamber where we can achieve coalescence growth and then eventually sedimentation and, and maybe entrainment as well. And, and as this arrow suggests, all of these processes are coupled together you know, in, in terms of the microphysics. So thanks a lot for your attention and happy to take other questions. So if yes. you have any questions, please come to the mic. It's a very fascinating talk. And the one question in my mind, I, I want to see your chambers. Can you chamber somehow to simulate the cloud feedback with global warming? Maybe with different, mm -hmm. you do the same experiment with different surface temperatures, things like that. That, that would be a dream. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. That, that sounds really tough. That that really sounds very interesting. No, of course, <laughs> of course it would be interesting, but I'm trying to think how you would, how, how would you build in the feedbacks? I don't know, you, you, maybe you could adjust your boundary conditions in a way that you think the feedback should operate, um, and maybe you could do it that way, but you'd, I think you'd have to have some outside information coming in, either from a large scale simulation or from your larger scale you know, remote sensing or whatever, to say, okay, if the microphysics changes in this way, do this to the forcing to get the feedback. Right now, the forcing, I mean, that's, it's, it's the beauty and the weakness of lab work, right? The beauty is we're controlling the boundary conditions. So there's no ambiguity about what they are, right? We control the forcing, and it's steady in time. It's not like nature where we have diurnal cycles or island effects or all of these complicating things. We control them. It's fixed. We know what it is. But of course, the drawback is we control them. There are no feedbacks. So, yeah. You did not mention whether you can uh, measure velocity by tracking individual droplets. You, you can technically measure the speed and velocity in either just one dimension or if you're, you know, uh, move the laser beam, you can measure in 3D. Um, are you doing that currently? Because I think that would be really useful to have 
vertical, yeah, to so, have lateral vertical, all the velocity of individual drops. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> we don't do it regularly. It, it turns out for most of the questions that we've been asked, that's not one of the central variables that we felt like we needed to measure. Uh, but we have, we use the holographic system, and we have a PTV, a particle tracking mu asymmetry system that we set up sometimes to, you know, to try to get turbulent energy dissipation rates and things like that. Um, I think that there, so one of the things we're interested in, there's, there's a feedback effect involving entrainment th that involves the sedimentation speed of particles. Uh, Chris Brotherton, Graham Feingold, others have, have written papers about this, and uh, I think we could maybe look at it here and in a sort of controllable way by looking at exactly what you suggested, looking at the actual drop, drop speeds, yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk, that was awesome. I have like five or six questions, but I'll okay. just ask one. Um, the uh, experiment you did with the supercooled liquid water and you introduced the IMPs, are yeah. you able to maintain, like say you just introduce a few, are you able to maintain a steady state or does eventually the ice win out? No, no, that's the amazing thing about the experiment is we, it, it's steady state. That's that amazing. You reach, you reach a, you know, let's say 10% glaciated or 20% glaciated, and it just stays there. It's like an Arctic stratus cloud, right? Yeah. It just stays mm -hmm. there. And, and it's super simple in hindsight. So you can take like Korolev, Mazin theory, and you know, that, you know, there are these, some of you are probably familiar with, there are these updraft conditions on like, how strong does an updraft need to be to sustain both liquid and ice together? or to only sustain ice. Well, you can, com you can generalize that basically to just forcing. Updraft is just a form of forcing, right? So, and, and it matches the results really, really nicely, as it should. I mean, it's thermodynamics, so it's been around for a while. It's, uh, so yeah, it just matches. If, if for a given uh, ice microphysical properties, the phase relaxation time is what matters, the ice phase relaxation time. Uh, Th that determines what strength of forcing you need to be able to maintain both liquid and ice in a steady state. Mm, that's really cool. Thanks. So, so the growth process is very sensitive to the power law spectrum of the turbulence. And your boundary conditions, at least your top one, is not, is not rep representative of what happens in a cloud. In a cloud, the top boundary condition is a radiative boundary condition, mm -hmm. and yours is a conductive boundary That's condition. That's correct. And that changes the nature of the turbulence. Have you thought about running some experiments at very low Rayleigh number, so that the, 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 the convective motion is very slow to see how that might impact the size spectrum? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is a really interesting and, and, and fundamental question. Um, so you're right, I, I mean, the typical mixed layer idea that we have is a surface forced or cloud top radiative cooling forced mixing of the system. Whereas here, we're forcing from both the top and the bottom, essentially equally, right? So it's a more symmetric forcing. Um, so if I understood your question, it, it's can you find a way to go to one of these regimes where you're forcing from one boundary and no, not I, both. I don't think you can do that. Okay. But I think, I think we could explore this problem in more detail if, we knock the, if you knock the really number really that close, like a couple times critical. Mm -hmm. and have very, the, the power law spectrum of the turbulence will be very different. And you might see differences in the size spectrum. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I mean, so yes, we can reduce the Rayleigh number. Uh, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think it's really hard because you need a really small temperature difference. You need a really small temperature difference. That really yeah. but, there, but there are other ways you can reduce it because you have two knobs that you can turn here. You have water vapor and Rayleigh, really, so it's actually moist convection, right? So you really need to have a, like a water vapor modified Rayleigh number, if that makes sense. So it's, it's essentially you would have to replace temperature with a virtual temperature. And you can play some games with salt boundary conditions to try to modify the Rayleigh number that way. But I think it's still hard to go to close to critical. Um, but it, interesting idea, really, really interesting. Sorry, let's have two last questions. One is Derek, but before that I wanna, 
ask a question that comes from, from uh, someone online, from Brian Van Hersen. And the question is, how well can you control CCN in the submicron range, and how does the radius affect the reflectance submicron? Okay, thanks. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I'll make overstatement here, and then I'll qualify it. I mean, in principle, we can produce whatever CCN we want within some bounds, right? So we can, we can choose, you know, with the differential mobility analyzers or, or whatever technique we're using. Uh, usually what we do is, you know, we, for example, with sodium chloride, we would atomize, which produces a broad distribution of aerosol particles. So we would atomize, then dry, and then we would use a DMA to take a little slice. And so we know, it just makes it simpler for us, right? We have one aerosol composition and one aerosol size. And then everything is easy to interpret. Uh, and, and, and you know you can go, you can go to the next stage to you know to have a poly disperse aerosol. All you need are two sizes, so you can start playing games where you put in aerosol size A and aerosol size B. So you only have two sizes, and, and see how they compete with each other. So the, in the answer about the optical properties of the cloud and how they respond, uh, it, it would depend on the CCN properties of the aerosol that we choose then. So for a given forcing, uh, you know, we can, we can put in, let's say for a given composition, we could put in smaller or larger aerosols and get a different cloud droplet concentration for a given forcing. And then the optical properties of the cloud would respond very much like I showed uh, in, in, you know, where I had the multiple snapshots. Uh, so yeah, definitely possible. Raymond, would you mind going back to the animation that you showed of the sure. laser illuminated cloud droplets? Yeah. Uh, let's and I see. apologize to Evan if I'm restating effectively the question you already asked, but you've focused on um, microphysics. I'm curious if you've studied microdynamics, right? I mean, there's all these questions about sort of how small scale turbulence concentrates or disperses cloud droplets and how that might lead to droplet spectrum broadening and the initiation of precipitation. Have you dug into that? Because it seems like there's a beautiful opportunity here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that was a little bit of the motivation for doing this in the first place. Uh, but it, it, it so, so the answer is yes and no, um, just it kind of in a nutshell. Uh, and it connects to one of the earlier questions about, you know, have we used particle tracking VLAS symmetry or have we looked at particle you know, velocity fields. So we have a little bit uh, using this type of data, um, MPTV. Um, but I think, the, I think the bottom line is that the energy dissipation rates in stratocumulus clouds are really low. You know, like t in, in, in SI units, 10 to the minus three watts per kilogram. And most of these hypotheses that deal with, you know, particle inertial effects and things like that, they really tend to turn on uh, when you reach higher dissipation rates, when you reach higher Stokes number, right, for the droplets. Where, where I think there's more possibility for interest here, so uh, to put another way, the Stokes numbers, even for the relatively large droplets here, are order like 10 to the minus two. So they're almost, other than their gravitational fall speed, they're almost passive tracers. Um, they're passive tracers, except that they're slipping down, you know, due to gravity. Uh, but I think the gravity part is really interesting, and that's what I want to look at, especially in connection to entrainment type problems. So. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a good time to thank you again for a wonderful presentation. A lot of questions. Apologize, everyone, for being 10 minutes too late, but it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.